housekeeping done and out of the way. So thank you so much for joining us today. We really are grateful that you've uh, given up some of your time to talk about this important issue and hear from a, a brilliant range of speakers. And the forum itself, the Sport for Climate Action Forum, was designed to bring together individuals and organizations from around the world for some showcases, workshops, and keynotes, focusing on the role that sport can play in protecting our environment. You're gonna hear from people at the cutting edge of this space. And as mentioned, you can build connections with your fellow passionate and like-minded change ma uh, makers who are also joining us today. Now here at Beyond Sport and in partnership with the Swedish Postcode Foundation, we believe that the unifying and energizing nature of sport really can help combat some of the apathy and lack of cooperation that often hinders really significant action on climate issues. And in order to make the global goals a reality by 2030, we know that sport must play a bigger role. And actually, we worked um, with, Beyond, with uh, Sw the Swedish P Postcode Foundation in 2019. We partnered together to launch the Sport for Climate Action Collective Impact Awards. This was a program that was designed to support a group of organizations um, working together on this issue, promoting Global Goal 13 through sport. They were provided with grant funding and year-round facilitator support. And you're going to hear from some of them later. We're closing out that collective impact program at the moment, and in doing so, we wanted to broaden the conversation, hence having this event, and we really hope to galvanize even more concrete action in order to protect our planet. I'm super excited about the selection of speakers we have lined up for you today. And what better way to start than by having a chat with David Given Hollander. He's project manager at the Swedish Postcode Foundation and a longtime supporter of Beyond Sport. David, welcome. Please do give David a warm welcome in the chat channel. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you for your support and your commitment to both Beyond Sport and the role of sport in climate action. And maybe let's just start by hearing your thoughts, that bigger picture on why you think sport is an effective tool to promote climate action. Yeah, hey, great to be here and uh, great to see so many people here today um, engaging in this conversation. I think that speaks to the desire to actually use sport as a tool when we are tackling climate change and, and in the area of climate action. I mean, when we look at the role that sport has, you can kind of look at that from two perspectives. You can look at that in the way that we organize, deliver and plan the sporting events and activities that take place around the world. And then you can look at as well leveraging the platform that we have uh, as a sporting movement and if you look at the first one I mean you're looking at everything from how we power our venues how we um, organize our events what food we serve uh, the transportation we use all these details that in, in, in a sense makes us more efficient as a, as a movement and reduces our climate impact when you look at the other side of that I mean, sport has the potential to reach millions if not hundreds of millions of people and if we're able to give information, if we're able to educate that movement, reach children in schools about uh, ocean conservation, like some of our speakers later on today is doing Iron Water, uh, using a collective uh, movement of people who are like-minded to lobby and, and campaign for more green policies um, at a at regional, local and national level. Um, and to use the, the elite performance platform that reaches millions of people through different uh, communications mediums to engage those people to, to build a movement and, and a united voice that sport wants to improve uh, this area of work. And I mean, if you just take an example from Sweden, we have 3.5 million people engaged in our sporting movement. We have a population of about 10 million people and there's 3.5 million members. Now, if we're able just to reach a fraction of those people and we're able to educate and mobilize them into united voice, pushing towards climate action, I mean, that's a pretty loud and powerful voice that's difficult to ignore. And thinking about that, you know, you could tackle any number of issues, but strategically, the Swedish Postcode Foundation has chosen to support organisations at that intersection of support and environmental protection. What's been the driver? What's made you make that decision? 
Well, I mean, for those of you who don't know who the Swedish Postcode Foundation is, I'm well aware that there's going to be people out there. I mean, we are a grant-making organization that supports projects worldwide in the areas of human rights, sustainable development, and environmental protection. So from day one, that has been a focus for the foundation. And we've kind of doubled down on that in the last couple of years and, and made significant investments in areas around biodiversity, environmentalism, and protecting tropical rainforests. One of the ways we do that is through sports-based interventions. And that's been an investment we've had in the last couple of years. And the reason we do that is the same reason why most of the people here today use sport is because we believe in the quote-unquote power of sport. We believe that sport should and has the potential and sometimes an untapped potential to create real lasting positive change on a wide areas wide range of areas from gender equality social justice education and absolutely climate uh, action and and that's kind of where the partnership and this project with beyond sport was born from the idea the shared belief that sport should as you said should and can play a role in climate action and when we entered the conversation back in 2018, 2019, uh, around this project, there, there was a bit of momentum. There was stuff happening. We, we were seeing progress and we wanted to capitalize on that. And I think we can reflect back now in the two, two and a half years that have been. And we have an international collection of organizations that have delivered a global campaign calling for action within uh, the sports movement. And now finalizing with, I think we have 200 people registered, over 200 people registered to engage in this conversation. So I think we're absolutely on the right track. And we now need to talk about what is the action? What's the next step? And given that we are speaking to such a large number of people who are already interested in this space, um, many of them will be coming from community sports organizations around the world. Many will be looking for funding for sport for climate action programs. And as you are a funder, let's just, you know, give us give us an insight into the, the funder mindset around the characteristics of a program that you and other funders might be looking to support in this space. I'm not asking you to commit money to anyone out there, by the way, although a little bit I am. But you know, just give us a little bit of an insight as to you know the key things you're looking for. Yeah. Uh, what are funders looking for? I think that in itself, I'm pretty sure there's a lot of people out there who would like a conference just answering that question in and of itself. Um, and it's a great question. And I think, I mean, I obviously can't speak to, to every donor and funder that's out there. Everyone has their own objectives and aims. Having said that, I'm going to then speak to what every funder is looking for. And it's the same thing that everyone working in this space is looking for. We're looking for impact. We're looking for progress. Um, and I mean, when we're looking at the... We want to fund ideas, new and proven, that will take us a step forward in this process. And I mean, uh, when you're applying to funders, you are then needing to double down on that area. What is the impact you're creating? If you're doing education, how is that education turning into action? What is the change that is taking place? And what is it within the intervention that is creating that change? And I think that's what we're all looking for is to continue moving forward, test new ideas, push the boundaries, create new partnerships that tackles things in a different situation so that at the end of the funding cycle, we're somewhere where we weren't at the beginning of it. Yeah, really beautifully put. And I, that's exactly why we love working with you, really, is that we want to move things forward and try new things, but make sure that action takes place and we measure and manage that action as well. So thank you so much, David. I know you're going to be doing a little breakout session later on. So um, if people want to hear more from David, there will be an opportunity. But, you know, on behalf of Beyond Sport, thank you so much for your ongoing partnership and for helping us double down on this issue as well. But when we focus our attention, things happen and we've seen that happen. So thank you so much. And I get the great pleasure to take you from one brilliant David to another brilliant David. We are delighted to have Sky Sports news anchor and sustainability expert, David Garrido, hosting our first panel of the day. So please do give a warm welcome in the chat function uh, for David in the Game Changer panel, who will be looking at the role of professional sports in climate. David, it's over to you. Rada, thank you very much indeed. Um, thank you so much for the introduction. It's great to be working with you again. Uh, pleasure to be chairing this discussion as well uh, with these fine folk you can see on your screen right now. I'll introduce you uh, in a moment. Um, just uh, the briefest of, of backgrounds to me. Uh, yes, as you heard from Rada there, I'm a Sky Sports News presenter. Um, and I've been thinking for a while to take my own career in a more of a, a purpose-driven direction. So in the last six months, I've decided to take the plunge and, and really represent, having done a lot of thinking and I guess 
you know, COVID and, and lockdown one, two and three here in the UK has has at least afforded us that, um, that I wanted to represent for sport and sustainability, particularly climate action, uh, because those are the stories I really want to tell on air and discuss in forums like these. Um, and it's an area I'm very passionate about, which I sense is evolving all the time. And as you heard there from David, you know, we really want to see to see progress. And, and I hope that that's what this will help uh, promote and facilitate. Um, so let's get straight into it. This uh, session is entitled Game Changer, uh, the role of professional sport in climate action. It should be a fascinating chat in the company of, and you can see them here, uh, Lindita Jaffari Saliu, a sector engagement lead for the UNFCCC, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, we have uh, Roger McClendon, who is Executive Director of the Green Sports Alliance, and David Thomas, uh, who is Chief Commercial Officer at Southampton. Uh, joining us from Bonn, uh, from Louisville, Kentucky, and, and, and from the south coast of England, respectively. So we're really spanning the globe uh, with this. and it's, it's great to have you with us. Um, just before we hear from you initially, um, if any attendees have any questions, questions uh, for our speakers uh, over the course of the next 25 minutes or so please do use the chat function the beyond sport team will get those messages to me i'll endeavor to include them uh, as best i can um so uh, ladita roger david great to have you with us um obviously we are a little tight on time so i would appreciate uh, your brevity wherever possible but to start off with could you explain each individually a couple of things a what your role involves and b what has been consuming your time the most recently lindita if you'd start and then roger and david to follow thank you very much david and hi everyone i'm delighted to be part of this panel um so i serve at the un climate change secretariat i am responsible for uh, engaging a couple of sectors uh, on the road towards decarbonization so the idea is really to bring people together and uh, get them to agree on a common narrative that is aligned with the goals of the Paris Agreement. So in my in my job, I, I do a lot of work with sports as well and, and lead uh, Sports for Climate Action. Fantastic, thank you. Roger. Yeah, I'm Roger McClendon, the Executive Director of the Green Sports Alliance. And for those who are not aware of the organization, uh, it started with six members about 2010 and we're up to 300 members. So I think we're the largest sport and sustainability trade organization in the world. Uh, we also have a foundation and we have a greening uh, events organization as well. And, and really, you know, our focus is really building the trust within the leagues at the ground level. Uh, and what happened when I think about the, the three pandemics, you know, uh, COVID-19, um, social injustice that you saw in, around the world and, you know, highlighted in the US uh, and obviously climate change. And so through sports, what we're trying to do is bring that uh, that whole entire sports industry together to focus against those issues. Uh, so I'm glad to be here. Obviously, this is a very welcoming group, but what you saw in the US was a lot of division and, and really difficult to kind of move these initiatives forward. So I'm looking forward to having the conversation today. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that early on. I'm sure we'll get to that intersectionality uh, over the course of the next half an hour. Um, David, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Um, so yeah, I look after all of the commercial operations at Southampton Football Club who play in the Premier League, for those that don't know. Um, really what that means is anything that brings money into the club I'm responsible for. So things like sponsorship, so merchandise sales, ticketing. Um, but also I also look after all of the marketing operations, so communications, digital, comms, PR. Um, but also finally I'll look after um, responsible for the direction and overseeing the operations of, of our Saints Foundation, which is our charitable arm. Uh, so it's a um, big organization of nearly 70 people uh, that work for the club, all involved in uh, uh, action in the community and how we're, how the club is supporting the community. So I oversee all of that. Um, and in terms of your second question about what's, what's been keeping me busy, um, I think for now it's about really how we evolve and instrumental, I guess, in shaping the strategy for the club uh, moving forward um, and really thinking how that needs to change in a post-pandemic world. So, yeah, just a, a, a small subject to keep me busy. Well, yeah, you've, you've got a lot on your plate. That's a, <laughs> yeah, that's that's a conversation in itself, really. Yeah, um, exactly. uh, Lendita, let, let's start off with the, the, the UN Sports for Climate Action framework and, and what joining it actually means i mean essentially without wanting to, to simplify too much you can you can fill in the gaps for me here it is a, a pledge to stick two to five key principles involving sustainability and really embed them in the ethos the spirit and 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 the operation of a sporting identity and and and, and try and kind of make that what people stand for more uh, as a club reaching out to its community both locally and also 
globally with its fan base. Would, would that be right? Would you like to uh, just maybe expand on that for me? Yes, thank you, David. Well, you know, I mean, if you, if you look at climate change, we, we know that it requires all hands on the deck. And, and trying to address it alone doesn't make any sense. It needs collective approaches. It needs everyone on board. Um, and it also takes combined effort of all sectors of society, including business, including sports. And that's the key behind UN Climate Change's um, Sports for Climate Action. And so it, Im it invites all sports uh, organizations to embrace the climate agenda, regardless of where they are in their climate journey. And it's got two objectives. First is to establish exactly how the sports community will combat climate change. And second, to use sports as a unifying tool to drive climate awareness and action among the general public. So these are the two kind of uh, objectives of the framework. But with 220 signatories, Sports for Climate Action is an example of how sports can unite to address climate change. Uh, though one thing needs to be made absolutely clear, the key word in the Sports for Climate Action is action. Um, so likewise, commitment to Sports for Climate Action framework is only the beginning and it must be backed with, with real, credible and measurable uh, actions. And of course, the signatories are at all levels across many different sports. You've you've got uh, football clubs, some of whom are are lower league or non league. Say, for example, here in the UK, you've got full you know uh, federations and and indeed governing bodies. Um, so essentially, it's a community across sport and the whole world of sport. How has that helped facilitate and normalise the conversation around sustainability? And how do you measure meaningfully the impact of the framework, Lindita? Thanks, David. That's a good question, actually. And as you mentioned, you know, the, the membership is really diverse in terms of sport, but also in terms of size and in terms of where they're at in their sustainability strategies and journeys. We have governing bodies, as you mentioned, federations, leagues, clubs, teams, uh, sport event organizers, uh, mega events, but also we've got sport media increasingly uh, joining and following up uh, on the lead from Sky and BBC Sports. So this diversity allows sports to learn from each other. Um, uh, obviously, there's lots of learnings that need to be made. There's not, not everybody knows um, how to start this journey. So it's, it's really to try and take advantage of that and, and, and establish that platform where people can come together and exchange their experiences yeah. and difficulties and challenges as well. What I should say, though, in terms of geographic spread, uh, a lot of signatories are overwhelmingly um, EU and US, uh, followed by a few signatories from Japan and Australia. So we need more participation, in particular uh, from uh, Global South. Um, and of course, inter interestingly, the framework did not grow because we've done a lot of outreach, but really as a result of signatories amplifying this call and bringing their peers into the conversation. And in terms of the launch, I think in terms of the uh, reporting, um, we've done a number of surveys to our signatories to try and understand where they're at and how are they approaching different sustainability aspects. And while we have signatories, as we mentioned, who are really well advanced and have started this journey earlier, we do realize that there are signatories that are just starting and not every organization have the same capacity and knowledge, which is why we're flexible in terms of public reporting in the first year. But we've co collectively agreed that annual public reporting is important. At the end of the day, all signatories have committed to it. And we have just finalized the process to do that starting from this year. Now, of course, nobody ever said, I can't wait to report, right? So this is an, <laughs> it was an intimidating factor that we uh, you know, saw from some of our signatories. But we try to really build on some of the existing practices of how some signatories are reporting. Um, and the idea with it is not to name and shame. The idea is really to understand where are some of the challenges coming from and how can we address those challenges collectively and at the same time getting an understanding of how can we use this power of all these sports coming together to influence adjacent sectors, transport, uh, you know, aviation and others um, that sports interacts with so closely. Yeah, I think that point about about cross pollination and sharing best practice is so important. And you know, there are some you know, sporting entities. I mean, Wolfsburg in in the latest Bundesliga sustainability table, which I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about uh, those projects in a moment. But they've been reporting for a long time, and I'm sure that they could share you know how they go about it to help those who are who are not so far down the track. And um, Roger, let me come to you. Uh, the, the Green Sports Alliance is is well placed to 
you know, uh, I suppose across some key pillars, which we'll, which we'll discuss, um, to, to help the professional sports sector. But can you give me a read from your perspective? Because you're right in the middle of the conversation here. Yeah. You're talking with people like Lindita at the UN. You're also talking with people like David at Southampton. How is sport doing in terms of embracing sustainability? If you like, give us a, a grade, uh, whether it's, a, you know, a, a mark out of 10 or a, a B minus or, or, or an A minus. How would you like to assess it? Yeah, I think it's a challenge because of what happened with, with COVID. Obviously, sports totally shut down. And so whether you're a nonprofit or you're or for profit, if you have no revenue and you have no business, this is a moot point. So the whole focus on health and safety and what's really important to folks now was to get fans back in stands and get the businesses back going safely. So there was a major shift. Uh, and although we had made some strides, you know, over the 11 years that we've been here through the leadership of sports teams, we're not where we want to be. Now, the shift was really interesting. In the U.S., we had these uh, large facilities with the leadership of owners to really take on the opportunity to open up their, their facilities as vaccination centers, to open those facilities up. Uh, and we've had over millions of vaccin vaccinations happening through these arenas and venues. They opened them up for voting centers when we are in the crisis uh, of creating new leadership here. And obviously we're getting back to this idea of climate. So I would say we're maybe a C minus, um, but it's not, it's relative to, there are some leaders, there are some folks just kind of getting in the game and to the latest point, there's some people that are behind. The segue to what the macro is when you have frameworks from frameworks to action is really probably what David will talk about here is what is the business case? How do you move your organization from the operational side to the business side within the context of sustainability? And I think that's where innovation, breakthrough innovation comes. And then the intimidation of signing up for, for a pledge or being a signator, there is a, there's a lot of, you know, kind of scariness when you don't really know the plan to get there. So where we come in is we're helping on the, on the ground day to day with major events like college football playoffs or working with all-star, MLB all-star games to figure out how you do it within the, I say the lines of the field or within the arena. And then what can you do that's beyond that at the community level to be really that leader that engages the community to influence fans to move toward this idea of sustainability? So that's really what we're focused on. Yeah, and, and it's a big part of, of being a signatory for the framework. That word promote or advocate, you know, messaging, get it out to the fans. That's how you make uh, meaningful change happen. Um, David, let's let's ask you then. I mean, you were part of, of, of this undertaking to, to, to launch a sustainability strategy, the halo effect. Um, you're among four Premier League clubs, uh, my latest count, who've signed up for the framework. Just how much of a, an undertaking was that, though, to kind of discuss and, and implement sustainability in a truly holistic way to change the way that the club will operate now and ultimately in the future? Uh, yeah, um, big question. Um, uh, uh, interestingly, uh, Lindita, I think, I don't know if you noticed, but you, you said three times or four times you use the word journey. Um, and, and that's exactly um, what we're on. We're on a journey. Uh, and probably our journey started maybe three years ago. Um, and I'll try and distill that journey in, in two minutes. But um, it probably started and really from a, a more operational basis, um, from the bottom up, um, where we started to really implement change where we could and almost organically uh, to help protect the environment. So just doing things that we would perceive as obvious now, things like reducing single use plastics, reducing energy use, water use, where we, where we can. And all of those things have been increasing over the last three years. Um, but... I think the, the real step change for us was when we really started to take it seriously as a management team um, at, at the club. And we started to really look at it, not from the bottom up, but from the top down. And for us, we're, we're really mindful that consumers now are really expecting all organizations, not just sports clubs, but businesses, organizations, to have a really clear sense of purpose beyond the relentless pursuit of profit. Yeah, and, uh, and that's about those organizations knowing why they exist to add value, how they add value to their customers and how they uh, add value back to society. And football clubs are no different. Um, increasingly, actually, all sports organizations are having to behave more and more like consumer brands. And that's about putting the customer at the heart of what they do. And for us, that's customer is fans. 
And our fans, we know that it's really important to them how we behave as a, as a football club. Uh, and behaving responsibly is really important for the fans, but also not just fans. It's also our staff. It's also our sponsors and our partners and also our, com our community. So it was really important for us that we lead in all aspects of corporate behavior. And what we're doing to protect the environment is just one element of that. So where those two things came together from a more strategic level from the top, a more operational level from the bottom, where they met was our sustainability strategy was born out of that point. Uh, and that ultimately what led to the halo effect. And just very briefly, it has just it has four key elements to it. It has all of our commitments that we're undertaking to help protect the planet and our environmental responsibility. But there's our corporate responsibility, which is essentially how we how we operate and run a good business uh, and a sustainable business and also how we treat people um, both inside and outside uh, everybody connected to the club the third element was our social responsibility so what we're doing as a club to to support those in most need in our immediate community and then our final element was around our fan responsibility so what commitments are we making to treat our fans fairly and equally and to provide an experience that they enjoy, but also want to repeat. So, wow, that was, uh, I hope that was short enough. But, uh, no, but well, you, you did sum it up very well. I mean, uh, David, I'll, I'll pick up on some of that again, because, you know, okay. well, Roger mentioned it as well. This this is a, a complex layered issue, but but just on, on one of those points, I mean, you know, this has got to also be considered in terms of, um, the making the club grow and yes, growing that that bottom line and improving it. But a lot of people think that the two things are mutually exclusive. You can't be fully sustainable and make money, but you can, and and you can think of the two within the same breath. You know, can you can you give us any sort of examples of of, of how you guys have, have managed to to harness that opportunity? Sure. Um, well, I think. First and foremost, we didn't set out with this in mind, but it's absolutely been a, a, an added benefit um, and, and, a, and a welcome a welcome one. Um, so I think there's probably a couple of areas. So the first, what we found is that having a really clear um, uh, sustainability strategy has been something that our sponsors and our partners have really engaged with because it's given them something tangible. So when you, when you move from it just being a, a hygiene factor where you're ticking boxes to actually, no, here's a thing, and we're really committed to this thing, it, you find that people want to get involved with it. So our existing partners have done that. Um, as an example, um, in our corporate responsibility pillar, we have, we're supporting um, uh, startup businesses with a, uh, with a 20,000 pound grant. So there's a, we're running a competition now. And our, one of our, our front of shirts uh, sponsor has helped contribute to that element of, of providing the grant. So that's an, a really great example for them to be able to talk about what they're doing to help support us in this space. Mm. So existing partners is one, but I can definitely say that having a really clear sustainability strategy has opened up multiple conversations with different and new brands, probably more purpose-led brands that we wouldn't have, just wouldn't have engaged with us in the past. Mm. And uh, yeah, I can't um, uh, talk to what those conversations are because they're all they're still ongoing. But um, yeah, hundred percent, it's opened up more opportunities. That's fantastic to hear, um, Roger. Just just to sorry, do you want to come in on this, Dendita? Yes, I just wanted to 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 touch on two things um, that David mentioned. You know, the, the decoupling of of sustainability and money, and I think. You know, climate change is a is a long term consideration, and I think it also requires a little bit of a uh, change in in mindset. Uh, you know, as, as as David referred to as well, in in the sense that you you cannot um, you know the there might be some costs involved uh, at the beginning. There's lots of models to show that, but um, over the long term there will be uh, benefits, um, and it's not necessarily that you have to see you know, embedding a real holistic, robust sustainability strategy that it's going to kill your business. I think that's a completely wrong wrong mi mindset um, to have. And, and, and so it's great to see that a lot of our signatories have already started to, um, and, and some have been doing that already, but start to think about, okay, that now we have to depart this business as usual model and, and how does that look like? And also um, in terms of what David said about 
you know, having more people involved once they know what your strategy is and the direction that you're taking. I think we're seeing that from many signatories actually who are, uh, you know, taking on this purpose of sustainability and climate action. And they've got lots of interest, not just by the media uh, currently, but also a lot of interest from businesses who are like-minded and want to support them in, in that journey. So I just wanted to make that. Yeah, no, it's a, it's, a, it's a great point to make. And, and I think it is an important one to elicit out there for, for people who are thinking of embarking on the journey. Um, and, and to Roger, I, I wonder, you know, you're dealing with with all sorts of organisations, you said sort of college football teams up yeah. to, a, you know, an MLB All-Star game. Um, what are the, the sort of challenges that you hear people reporting back to you when they're starting on the journey? And also, I wonder if you can bring in the, the point that you uh, were mentioning right at the very start about how complex it is when you when you consider sustainability, not just all about uh, environmental awareness, but but how it's impacted by other factors such as racial and, and, and social inequality. I wonder if you could talk to that point for us briefly. Absolutely. I think David hit the nail on the head. It's a holistic strategy that actually drives business. It's not something separate. It's integrated into what you do every day. And when you base that on those principles and you really look at disruptive innovation and technology, what that allows you to do is benefit from it. Now, the driver is not necessarily to drive for profit. The driver is to drive to support your consumer. And I'll share some statistics from Portis Novelli. Uh, Porter Novelli. So 96% of consumers feel their own actions can make a difference in the world. Uh, that's a much bigger number when I was the chief sustainability at Young Brands. Those, those numbers weren't that high. 88% uh, of consumers would like brands to help them to be more environmentally friendly and ethical in daily life. Uh, another statistics around consumers are supporting the environment with their wallets. 81% uh, plan to buy more environmentally friendly products than they did in the, uh, five years ago. Actually, that was in the next five years. 72% buy environmentally friendly products today than they did five years ago. So what we're seeing is this shift in consumers' expectations, whether you're the NBA or you're Southampton FC, or you know, you're know um, Procter & Gamble, talking about some brands or Ikea, the expectations of what consumers want from you is to be purpose-driven and not just to say it, but to prove it. And, and so we saw that, we, we saw the actions and we, you know, we don't want to have this greenwashing effect or social washing effect. We want people to actually move to action, including corporations, sports teams and et cetera. So for us, it's about the plan. And, and, and when you really look at the assets of where you are geographically and what's happening um, from a legacy standpoint with the people you live and work and play with that come to support your team because they have a love for that team, right? But they also want to know what are you doing to make sure that that water stream is clean or, you know, the, 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 the plastics that you have at your game are being reused and not becoming microplastics in the ocean. And so this is the real driver for us. And so we want to build those plans that, that give them confidence to support Lindita and the UNFCCC or what other frameworks that are there so they confidently can do that. And I think that's the fear factor. And that's where we're trying to, to bridge that gap is to bring the solution providers to be able to really create a very specific plan that can drive the action to move us to zero. Kind of the concept of playing for the next generation and play to zero is what I call it. Uh, let's um, bring in a, a question from the audience. Uh, Mika Evans at, at Think Beyond uh, has offered this. Uh, what, what can consumers do themselves to help sport become more environmentally sustainable? Is it more lobbying, more action, or calling out or, on sport to do more. Um, uh, Lindita, do you want to, to offer an answer to that potentially? I mean, we've heard, you know, what from, from what Rogers just said there, that, you know, that there, there is a real desire, you know, the audience is becoming more captive and more active, but, but what else can consumers do? Yeah, I mean, there was were some interesting reactions, you know, um, uh, when some football clubs, uh, Premier League football clubs sign on to the framework and you could see, you know, the competitive club fans saying, hey, when are you going to join this? You know, uh, don't make me switch switch sides, right? <laughs> so I think the this whole conversation goes back to, you know, the that kind of significant shift that we're seeing today. Um, and so I think there, it's not just one thing that that uh, fans could do, uh, but uh, many things actually, you know, by, by lobbying for sure, by communicating it, but also by... Uh, trying to find ways to work with their with their uh, preferred clubs, especially if they're you know local and, and part of that community, to help uh, build that strategy to be more robust. I think you know 
if we t we're talking about clubs specifically, for example, a club in itself, if they if they are the only ones doing it without bringing in all other stakeholders into that conversation, I think it's not going to be robust enough. So mm -hmm. it's important to really have a way for these fans to, to voice their concerns, but also to come together and help them create solutions and help them find better ways to do things. Um, so definitely lots of different ways in which fans can, can affect their clubs. Uh, and one thing that... Oh, go on, David. Well, I, I just just on a really basic level, I just uh, add to that. Even be be the change you want to see. Yeah. So if 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 fans are wanting their clubs to uh, to to show and demonstrate change, then actually if fans can start to demonstrate that change themselves. So for us, that's about you know supporting our things like uh, reusable plastics in the stadium. You know, and uh, you know in terms of drinking cups, recycling where we can actually cutting down on driving to the stadium and cycling more, using more sustainable transport uh, uh, options, things like that. Actually, if, uh, if it starts from the fans, then you know, the club will, um, uh, combined efforts, will actually help to, make, uh, to have a bigger impact. We're running out of time, guys, I'm afraid. But um, David, I just want to come back to you because obviously, you know, you have a number of high profile footballers um, at Southampton, some some stellar names that are, you know, either uh, emerging talents through the, the homegrown initiative. You know, you've seen uh, first team players uh, make, uh, sorry, academy graduates make the first team squad. You're planting 250 trees for each one of those who, who makes his uh, senior debut for Southampton FC. But I do sort of wonder with the athletes, um, you know, are you sensing that they are responsive to the sustainability strategy? that they themselves want to represent that there's less fear of hypocrisy because of who they are and what their lifestyles are because that's something that, that fans and the community respond to as well of course yeah absolutely absolutely um so it, the, the reality is um since we launched the halo effect which we did in january it was a uh, six months in, in the planning it's basically all been done since we've been in lockdown so um so our direct interaction with with uh, our players has been really reduced so um, I've not been able to engage them in the way that perhaps I, I may have done. Um, however, um, from the little where we have been able to engage them, they've been really supportive. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly um, it's probably some, some of the more senior players that um, are, are really aware of their responsibility in this, in this space. They, they, they appreciate the, um, the role that they have as well as the role that the club has. Um, and the privileged position and the platform and the voice that the club has um, uh, to really help drive positive change. And they understand that they are a big part of that. So it's going to be something that post lockdown, uh, we're going to be working more with them on uh, and really getting them uh, actively engaged. We, we hope to see more Hector <laughs> Bayerins um, emerge, certainly over uh, the, the months. Not, not a Southampton, you won't. <laughs> well, no, no, maybe not, unless, unless you sign him, of course. Um, <laughs> now, just, just very briefly, just before we finish, um, to Lindita, just interested to, to know what's the next step for the framework, certainly with COP26 on the horizon later this year here in the UK. What's the next phase we go into with that? Yes. So we um, are, uh, we have, as I mentioned, 220 signatories with lots of others in the pipeline. And I think two years after the launch now, we are ready to kind of move to some more concrete recommendations. If you all remember, Sports for Climate Action's second principle refers to organizations preparing climate neutral plans and looking for ways how to get there. Now we know it's not going to be perfect uh, because it's, it's a difficult thing. It's not that easy, but I think we have to start. And I think the majority of our signatories realize that um, we are seeing some really uh, interesting commitments coming from different uh, clubs and also governing bodies and others. And I think that there's a real appetite to move now uh, to translate those principles into concrete actions. Uh, <clears throat> so we have just recently worked with signatories to develop how that net zero commitment would look like for these signatories um, and what is in and what is out and just really trying to be as clear and as transparent as possible about it. So that is coming out uh, soon um, for all signatories to, to adopt and uh, by COP, Hopefully, we'll have uh, we'll have a good a good number of signatories who will then be very clear about things that need to be done uh, going forward. 
And it'd be nice to see some more of that that gamification that we talked about, mm -hmm. you know, that that cross pollination, see what we can share, how we can creatively come together across the world of sport. Just one final question, and it comes from the audience, from Claire Paul from Sport Positive Summit. And, and I'd like to ask this to all of you. So if you could be super brief, let's say a maximum of five words for each of you for this answer. <laughs> um, where would you recommend sports organizations start if they are just starting their journey in sustainability? You've all got different perspectives on this, but I'm going to ask you for five words each, please. So actually, uh, let's give Roger the first the first shot at it. Yeah, I would say leadership, uh, commitment, uh, know-how and innovation, uh, investment, and then execution. Okay, you've had six, but I'll accept that. That's okay. Um, <laughs> and he, he had all of my words. So those, those were the ones I was going to say. <laughs> it's okay. We can repeat a bit, David. What 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 would your what would your overriding thought on this be? Um, uh, maybe just uh, the approach that we've taken, which is uh, bottom up and top down. So that, that's five right oh, there. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> oh, yeah, five, yeah. The, perfect, the perfect solution. Um, and and Lindy, to finally to you, if people are starting on the journey. What what should they be thinking about? Well, five year, five words is really a, a tough, um, yeah. But uh, I will just say, you know, uh, let's set the pace for climate action for the world. Um, we we need to be able to demonstrate leadership on on this critical climate issue, and sports can do it. It's it's not that difficult. We can make this happen collectively. Sports can do it. That's four. You see, look, there you go. Roger used one more. You used one fewer. And David was bang in the middle. So I think we managed to do it. Sports can do it. That's a lovely note, lovely note to finish on. Um, can I can I just say maybe one one thing, which is my my recommendation would be just go back to that analogy of a journey, you know, and every journey starts with the first step. So just start. Start somewhere. Just get on with it. Just let's start. It, yeah. Let's 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 be positive. Let's take steps <laughs> forward. Listen, what what an engaging discussion, and, and thank you so much. I think we we could have gone on for for much much longer. I'm sure if people have questions for you, then in the networking sessions a bit later on um, at this Beyond Sport event, they they maybe can can accost you and uh, and speak to you individually. But um, to to Lindita to Rogers to David, thank you ever so much. Really really appreciate your uh, your your attendance and and your insights today. And uh, I'm sure we'll speak much much more on this in the future. Thank you Absolutely. ever so much. Thanks, David. Thank Thanks, David. Thanks, Any time. Rada, it's back over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, David, and thank you to our panelists. Great to see you, and, and thanks again for hosting that for us. What a brilliant panel. I've learned so much in such a short space of time, and wow. And, and one of the things that was said at the end is that sport can do this collectively and that's really the tone uh, and the theme of our next panel it's about the impact of cross-sector partnerships and we have another panel of experts coming your way so please give a warm chat box welcome to cindy mendoza the development director at i am water dan redding head of sustainability at world sailing and doc mabia program manager at youth zones Thank you all of you for joining us today. Really warm welcome on behalf of Beyond Sport and the Swedish Postcode Foundation. To all of you that are watching and listening, any questions for our crew as the conversation develops, pop them in the chat function and I'll feed them into play. But let's start by hearing from each of you. I know that you're all doing incredible work promoting climate action in quite different ways, but I'd love for you to tell our audience how your organization playing a part in environmental protection. And I'm going to come to you, Cindy, to start with. Tell us a little bit about Land Water and what you're doing. Great. Well, first of all, just a big thank you to Beyond Sport and the Swedish Postcode Foundation for providing this platform and inviting I Am Water to speak on a very important topic. Um, as mentioned, I'm the development manager at I Am Water, and we focus on a multi-dimensional approach to environmental protection, incorporating the human element, and we operate with the ethos you protect what you love. We combined um, immersive snorkeling workshops with powerful environmental lessons to create more environmentally literate youth who want to protect our planet. So when kids come to our workshops or come to our programs, children feel safe to be in nature, to be in the ocean, have positive experiences. They also have positive role models um, who are coaches and um, they also learn new skills uh, about pressing challenges facing our climate, facing our ocean, so that they can walk away with practical skills and that they feel empowered to, to protect their planet.
I mean, someone had to do it. And of course, that someone had to be me trying to speak on mute. Cindy, thank you. Um, you protect what you love. What, you know, that really says it all, doesn't it? Um, Doc, tell us a little bit about Youth Zones. Yeah, so we work in uh, another project called Shaula Butomi, which is, uh, it means choosing life on a vernacular for Shangan in South Africa and Mozambique and Zimbabwe. So we they speak Shangan, so which means uh, choosing life. So it's more focused on life on land, which is more co uh, conservation and sport. And uh, for us, why we chose the word uh, choosing life or Shaula Butomi, it was uh, we work with the poorest uh, villages in, inside, which are trapped inside the, the parks where we work. And um, some people choosing life can mean to protect the rhinos uh, or the nature, but to the people who are trapped there who don't have, um, what do you call it, options uh, to live. Uh, basic rights uh, in terms of uh, bathrooms, there's no shops, uh, there's no other alternatives to uh, generate income. So for them, generally, um, choosing life can mean just to survive. So, and uh, we basically trying to, I'm gonna speak more about that, but we're trying to use, um, protect the, protect nature, but at the same time also make sure that we, we consider people who uh, stay in the communities, in those villages around South Africa, Mozambique and Zimbabwe. Okay, we're definitely going to pick up a bit more on that. Thank you, Doc. And coming to you, Dan. Hi, and firstly, thanks for thanks for having me. Um, World Sailing is the International Federation of the Sport. So sports of kiteboarding, windsurfing, sailing in, in all its forms, really. Um, membership based. Uh, so we have 146 national federations and also class associations that um, form our kind of governance. And, you know, as a sport that harnesses the power of nature, certainly um, kind of what, what the others um, said about protecting your playground, that's that's really relevant. So we set up, um, established a uh, sustainability strategy that targets the sustainable development goals. And we have a raft of um, targets which range from um, well, delivery a couple of years ago up to 2030. Um, and climate change is certainly uh, one of those key issues that we're working on. Brilliant. Thank you. And so, Dan, you also, building on from the previous panel, um, well saying are signatories of the UN Sport for Climate Action Framework. So why did you think it was important to join that collective of organisations as opposed to just carrying on with what you're doing individually to protect your own playground, as it were? Yeah, that's a question. I mean, firstly, I think um, we we were quite keen to to participate when it was for launch from the outset and, and help develop um, what we see today and continue um, to develop what, what's required of the, the signatories. So firstly, we can kind of go off and do our own thing, but there's much more power when you've got, well, 220 organizations now. So when we start to challenge the same suppliers, when we start to um, talk about how we engage with our fans, participants, athletes, there's, I think, you know, we're sort of limited in what we know, but by um, having a dialogue with all the other different sports um, entities there's so much more um, experience and initiatives that we can learn from and and hopefully we can we can also um, sort of give some examples of what we've done as well so it was really important for us to, to be part of that and uh, it's great to see it growing um, and going from strength to strength. And have any specific things that you could point to change since you've joined that framework? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we we've got a few initiatives. Um, we've got some, uh, I suppose, as a as an international federation, looking at things like the regulation and um, equipment. So, looking at life cycle assessments and um, and changing policies to look specifically about uh, what kind of materials are used within the sport. Then we've got the opportunity to educate. So, trying to make more people um, carbon climate literate. So, uh, we've created an education program that's in 13 different languages and being used by many of our national federations. We've got grassroots programs looking at sustainability, energy assessments for clubs. Um, and that's kind of all happened since, since we signed on as a signatory and um, just giving us the motivation to do that. And I think from a board level, knowing that we're participating in a, a UN initiative, um, it really puts the pressure on to make sure that we deliver on um, our kind of our committed um, targets. Brilliant, thank you. And one of the things that you also committed to, as did um, Cindy at the team at I Am Water, was that you were both part of the Beyond Sport and Swedish Postcode Foundation's collective impact uh, project. And 
one of the things you mentioned there, Dan, was about learning from each other. So we had a group of organizations, we brought you together and you collectively both shared your own experiences, created new ones together. And, you know, it's great that you were able to do that, but we've got a big audience, we've got Doc here with us. I'd love to um, hear from both of you, really, any key learnings from working together that you would like to share to the wider group of people that we have listening. I'll, I'll come to you first, Cindy. Yeah, well, I mean, firstly, the winning the award was just an incredible opportunity um, to talk about our work at a in an international platform, but it also provided very much needed support for our COVID relief for our coaches. Um, but I think one thing that we really took away from it was the power of building relationships um, in the nonprofit space with other like-minded organizations and getting to know people by doing a project. So we actually did a project where we collectively came together, um, all from very different spaces, but youth sport is what brought us together. Um, and we were able to build a sense of community and talk about challenges that maybe we were facing or struggling with, with within our organization that other organizations were facing. So that was really great to have. And particularly during COVID, having that sense of community um, last year and still having those calls and checking in with people, realizing what was happening in other parts of the world um, was motivation. And it was like inspirational for our team to keep doing what we were doing in, in Cape Town, South Africa. Brilliant. And to be able to, in the moment, adapt to how the world changed and be able to do it with others is obviously something we've heard a lot about. And it's great to see you bring that to life. What about you, Dan? Yeah, I, I, I sorry. Was that Dan, wasn't it? Yeah, I'll, I'm going to come yeah. to you in just a moment, Doc, I promise. <laughs> okay, yeah, so I mean, I echo some of um, the, the previous comments. I mean, firstly, I think the, the enthusiasm from everybody was, was fantastic. Obviously, it was quite a challenging period when we were going through the, the process of delivery. Um, and just a shout out to some of the other um, winners, I think. So Manta Sailing, first and foremost, is, is a, um, a grassroots sailing organization in Vietnam. And for us to, um, or for me especially to learn you know what are the challenges that that are happening over there and actually with some of the great work that they're doing um, and because of one of the things that I mentioned earlier about the education program we got that translated into Vietnamese and hopefully that's a resource that, that can be used um, protect our winters as well more of a kind of a lobby campaign type it was quite good to see uh, how they're strategically um, kind of using social media and um, some of the campaigns that that they're doing and an AEG about some of the um, about all of the broad venues and um, teams and the, the kind of uh, energy and carbon monitoring that they do was was really interesting. So, yeah, it was, um, I think for, for me, just having um, dialogues with people all around the world in slightly different organizations in terms of scope and size. Um, so it was a really fantastic project to be uh, a part of. Brilliant, thank you. Doc, I think you were gonna jump in there and, and say something. So I'm gonna let you say something before I ask, answer, ask a question, if that's all right. No, that's, that's okay. But I just want to add uh, from what Cindy said that we also, in terms of uh, conservation, we we have a, a serious partnership. Like we, we can do things by ourselves. So, for example, we work with Peace Parks, who are um, they are responsible for all the parks uh, in South Africa, Mozambique, and Zimbabwe. We operate, and uh, we've got a big mother body, which is a, a GLTFCA. I want it's gonna be long to explain to you, but uh, uh, they cover all the all the parks and. Uh, we have all, and what I want to say is also in these parks we got uh, your uh, the sun parks, your Anak, uh, in Zimbabwe we got your Ghana Zoo, but those are the uh, associations which are responsible for um, for the parks. So we need to work with them, no matter how much you can do the sports site or bring the athletes, but you need also the people who are responsible for the parks. And just building on that, and how interesting your work at Youth Zone is, and the Peace Parks project specifically that. It's not just about Global Goal 13, that is directly promoting peace and social justice as well, as well as education and, and many more things. How can you, how do you get the balance and how do you promote conservation and peace and crime reduction effectively together? Yeah, so as I said earlier on, is so where we work, the, the communities where we work, they're trapped inside the park. So you're talking about the um, indigenous people, the natives who have been, were born there, they've got graveyards, they've got history there. So now you go to the park, now you put the animals inside. Those people got no alternatives, got no easy procurement uh, initiatives. So they're vulnerable to be, uh, to be honest. So 
So what we now automatically that some of them they start going around the bush, they get vulnerable to destroy nature, to deforest. Some of them, uh, yeah, the project was started because uh, people were killing many rhinos, as you know, around the world. It's a global crisis. And that's why we started this project, because the rhinos were getting killed, uh, except the bush. But uh, now that automatically made uh, a conflict between the, the parks and the people inside the community. And then we had to use the sport as a, a medium or platform where the, the park can come not as an enemy, or the communities can come as a, uh, as a what do you call it, the destroyer or the, the criminal. So the sports was a platform where they can come together and able to be dialogue and to, to talk to each other peacefully and teach each other. So automatically, uh, there's a lot, lot of lo loss of life there in the bush. And uh, yeah, um, for the last few years, but uh, it has reduced for the, our engagement in a different way. And that automatically, when people, you stop that conflict between the parks and the people, that already you bring some kind of peace uh, amongst those two people. Mm -hmm. And automatically, also the other big thing is, what we work is, we trying to say the people are not the problem. Um, we, especially if there's no alternatives, what do you expect someone who's hungry in the bush, got nothing to do, right? So, so automatically we get more activities where they, now you're talking about the sustainability, generate income. We start, we know from the sport part, they can play as much as they can, but they need to eat. And we start initiatives where they can start to generate their own income, to make their own leather products in the bush, so they can make their own craft stuff, and they can take the reception of the park. And then automatically, they're gonna feel, they're gonna have income, but automatically they're gonna feel part of the, being part of the park. And that's what we try to ownership and feel being part of and not be excluded. So the people are not the problem, but people, we take care of them by getting income, automatically they'll take care of the nature around them. I think, I mean, that brings to life so many things, not only how you practically use sport within that space, but also the intersectionality of how climate action affects those most vulnerable, but it's yeah. those most vulnerable people that can also make such a difference. And as you are describing people in the space coming together, in my head, what I'm hearing is Cindy saying, we protect what we love. And I feel like I can see those two things coming together. And now I know, Cindy, you did tell me, you, you did pay a visit to the youth zones. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit about that experience. Use the word life-changing for me. So I'd love if you could share that story a bit with our audience. Yeah, I think that was really just uh, my ability to see the power of sport and and and, and solving different challenges. Um, so I did a visit um, when I was at my previous employer, Laureus, um, to the resettlement villages. Um, we visited Zimbabwe, Mozambique, and the South African side. Um, and just being able to play sport with the girls, um, the little girls in the villages, um, joining them, being able to see the sparkle in their eyes. And again, I think in, in a similar aspect, when we talk about the I am water work in this, in this project, you know, football or soccer was the hook that brought the children to the project so that they can learn environmental education. Whereas in, in I Am Water, we use snorkeling um, as the hook to teach um, children environmental education and how to protect their oceans. So yeah, I think it, it was great to be able to see it. Um, my first time to, to the Kruger, to Zimbabwe and to Mozambique. Um, and I think it really just also speaks to the power of like going and really understanding people's lived experience. And that also allows you to make programs and design programs that are better suited for them. Um, so something particularly that I like with I Am Water is that South Africa, like we see in, in Limpopo, in the Kruger, it has so much nature to offer. It has, you know, South Africa has a coastline of over 2000 kilometers. And if you look at Kruger National Park and in the same way, but some of these kids like in, in, in this project have never seen a rhino, have never seen an elephant. And in the same way I am water, we have children that live within walking distance to the beach, but have never experienced a po had a positive experience with the ocean or have never seen an octopus on underwater um, or the kelp forest, which South Africa has to offer. So I think through programs like HV and I am water, we're able to provide these transformational experiences and provide education so that kids can fall in love with it and actually understand why it's important to protect it or to take actions um, to, yeah, to reduce um, climate change. Brilliant. And I'd love to sort of, 
build that out. So we've heard like what what people are doing, how we are creating environments and experiences whereby people can start to engage with what's around them, understand their role within it, take some action. But how do we know if we're being successful or not? So maybe we're going to shift the conversation a little onto impact, building on some of the stuff the previous panel said. Look, I'm going to come to you, Dan, to start with. You mentioned a number of the initiatives. It's not an easy thing to talk about impact when we're talking about such a big topic. How do you distill that down to seeing the change that your programs are making? Love to see examples. Yeah, I mean, firstly, from um, th there's a few different metrics, I suppose. So we've got the the education piece, and I mentioned you know number of countries uh, or national federations for us, and number of kids that go through those projects. But then, in terms of kind of actual actions, we have our own events. So there's lots of concrete actions there where we can actually measure um, reductions in carbon emissions or waste um, elimination of single-use plastic, and so so that's the kind of thing that we record and we um, well we we monitor, but also we use it to um, to continually improve. But I think um, as I mentioned and alluded to, where some of the biggest opportunities certainly for the the federation type organisations is that if you can start to influence manufacturing then you know i think competitive sailing at an olympic level represents a, so we've got 70 million sailors worldwide and only you know a couple of hundred at the olympics so how can we use those pinnacle events to influence everybody else in in that chain um and a, an example that that we're still working on is about how can we so we did a um an assessment of where all of the carbon impacts were for for our events and actually the use of support boats so a rib that actually follows the sailing boat with a coach on normally was something that we we liked we we felt a need to um to address so we we created a challenge to the actual marine industry which is a hundred billion euro industry um with paris 2024 to to transition away from combustion engines and so we've start with, I mean, we've seen a step change in manufacturers citing the fact that Challenge 2024 that we set has made them invest in these technologies and starting to supply these boats that, OK, they might only be used by a small handful at our events, but there's hundreds of thousands of them globally. So actually using sport as that catalyst is is great. So. There's lots of different metrics and different ways of measuring it. So um, it's it, uh, and as we heard in the previous um, uh, sort of um, with the previous guests, I think starting about trying to baseline where you're at um, for all organisations is something that that's vital. But also looking at your scope. I mean, you've got scope one, two, and three, the carbon emissions. But looking at your scope in terms of who can you influence, who can you um, bring along the journey with you, and that's something that um, we're 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 still doing. But we do have some figures that. Um, I think motivate us to to do more. And what a great example of cross sector partnerships! You suddenly galvanise a completely different sector from international federations. The entire supply chain that sits behind um, the marine sector has all now been engaged because you've set the challenge and sport has led that way. So, what a great example! Thanks for that, Dan. Uh, Cindy, how about you? What's what is success looking like, and how do you know you're getting there? Yeah, so in terms of the sustainable development goals, we focus on um, sustainable development goal 14, which is looking at life below water, but also closely looking at um, 13, which is what we're talking about today. So we look at um, improving education and awareness raising. And we also look at preventing um, or significantly reducing marine pollution of all kinds. Um, and what we do is uh, we have various qualitative and quantitative quantitative measures that we look at within the kids that go to our programs, um, which is not always easy to measure. Um, that's my area of expertise. So as people mentioned earlier, it's a journey um, and we are currently on that journey, um, figuring out what are the best measures to look at. Um, we're actually in the process of looking at a new survey, um, a validated tool. It's called the Environmental Education for the 21st Century. And what I like about this tool specifically is that it um, looks at various measures that are relevant, I think, both to the sport for development sector, but also for climate. I think sometimes they happen in parallel and they're not necessarily intersected. And that's what I really liked about this scale that it includes, you know, looking at environmental knowledge or shifting concerns of, of kids that attend our programs. But it's also looking at our kids having a connection with the place that they're at. Are they, you know, look, are, 
Are they more engaged in school? Are they problem solving? Because it's it's these measures that are gonna create environmentally literate and kids that are gonna solve the problems that we're facing today. Um, so those are some of the things that we that we look at, but it's a journey, um, you know, collecting data when your programs are happening on a beach. Um, they don't always go as planned, um, but we're really excited. And in the next year, we're looking to do a formal evaluation on our program, on our flagship program, the Ocean Guardians Workshop, working um, alongside a university so that ultimately we can improve our work and uh, improve our delivery and create um, even more environmentally literate youth in the future. Amazing. What's the name of that survey and the scale again that you mentioned? Um, it's called um, Environmental Education for the 21st Century. Awesome. Yeah, and, and if anybody would like, they could always reach out to me. Um, it's something that I'm really passionate about, looking at the intersection of environment, environmentalism and sport. Um, so I'm always happy to chat about that. Brilliant. Everyone in the audience, I really do hope that you've written that down. Uh, we, I know that the Beyond Sport team will have, so make sure you, you get, find out about that. It sounds awesome. Um, Doc, I'm going I'm to come to you. How do you know you're being successful? What changes are you seeing within the young people in the, in the parks? Yeah, so the first thing is you don't want the, the young people to be killed because they are very vulnerable by their arms. So the, uh, one of the best moments I had was one of the villages in Mozambique. Uh, it's in the middle of nowhere. It's called Mavoze. And, um, and the chief, he supports and, um, the, what, our program. So we're busy playing. They've got about maybe 100 kids, young kids, adults, um a youth so he said one thing he said dog since you've been here none of my guys have been to the bush they train every day they just love soccer that for me it means we saved a one young man or female from the bush to be being killed by the army so th that for me i don't know how to put in the ME, but that's for, for example that but of, of course but we had um two or two guys actually uh who uh, got a uh, lot to, to go to the, the bush and um the good thing about I like about it, one of them is Muoki. He's in one of the bush and one of the villages. And he just, uh, while he, uh, he came out of prison, he said, listen, I want to change my life. I want to go back to soccer because we're doing good. We're making our leather products. And I guess what? He's back now. He's coaching the youth. He's encouraging them. So for me, so it's, uh, small stories. Uh, it's great. But uh, the big one, uh, this, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not sure rather I've been into African villages like uh, the poorest ones. So... The issue of human rights, the women's rights, uh, it's difficult. And these girls, they get uh, for, forced uh, into, into marriage. Uh, some of them get raped. Uh, um, and uh, because of mostly because of these guys, they go and get this small money from the bush. But um, since we our program started, uh, all our girls, all of these villages are playing soccer, as Cindy said. And um, and we, didn't, we have only primary schools in the oldest villages. And uh, there's only one high school in town. And I can tell you now, we've got one nurse. And we've got one girl who's working in the park which is also a dream to, for these kids in the village, especially girls, to start being independent, to stand for themselves, not to fall for, for this girl. And we're also doing a, a bazaar program, which is part of um, where we're getting some of these girls to town, where they stay. And many of these girls now, they just seen the light. It's just like exploding. So for me, there's many stories I can say, but for me, that, that sense of they can see the impact the, the park is doing to them with these programs, and they can value it. And they, they're going to think twice to go to the bush because now they can see they're benefiting. They get solar kit, they get opportunity to work at the park or finish schools. So there's many examples. And some of them, if they're in the wrong side, they come back like Moki. Amazing. Thank you. And, and I think all of your examples talk to A, climate action doesn't sit in isolation, it sits yeah. in the intersects with many other things, and that we can't do the work in isolation. So we need to work together. And thank you for being shining examples of that.